Genesis 18 and 16. I believe that the Lord has given a word for today. Somebody say today. today. And this word isn't going to just be for New Life Church. This is a word from God for people, for believers. Come on, y'all. For believers. Jordan, you're going to have to stay with me today, my brother, just to let you know. Feel the need to speak towards the unprecedented events that have gripped our nation. People are afraid and confused and angry and demoralized. People are taking sides against each other. And yes, the media has spearheaded most all of this. Saints, I believe that we are called to be warriors. But we are called out of darkness to be warriors in the kingdom of righteousness. I strongly condemn those who perpetrated our nation's capital, and I do not believe that mounting an offensive against our government is the answer in trying to satisfy our frustrations. I might not get amens there, but I'm saying it anyway. I did not agree with the burning of our cities over the summer. No more than I agree with people breaking into our nation's capital this past week. Could there have been operatives in the crowd trying to paint the good people in a negative light? Absolutely. But the same thing could have been done this past summer. There's a much, much bigger issue that's taking place. A people, a nation, who are supposed to be one nation under God, are trying to fight a spiritual battle through fleshly means. It will never work. I said it will never work. If we're not taking our issues, our fears and frustrations before the Lord, then we will be making all of our decisions based on our own rationale, reasoning, fear, doubt, unbelief. Come on, somebody. Conspiracy theories and everything else. But I can tell you this, the Lord isn't sitting here and wondering, I wonder if this one's right. I wonder if this one's right. He knows what's right. Not only does he know what's right, he knows how to fight. There is a king in heaven. Can we agree? His name is Alpha and Omega. Can we agree? (laughs) He is the ordainer of our footsteps. Can we agree? Watch this. He is the one who told Abraham before he ever had children and grandchildren that your descendants will stay in a foreign land called Egypt. And they will be enslaved there for 400 years. And I will, I will, I will spank those that, that made them slaves. But I can't pull them out yet for the sins of the Ammonites has not yet warranted their destruction. God spoke this hundreds of years before He ever pulled Israel out to give them that land. This is the same God then that He is now. Come on, somebody. How many of y'all have made mistakes that have brought shame and guilt in your life since you got saved? Raise your hand real high. Okay? I want to tell you something. And the Lord spoke this word to me in prayer this morning when I was praying over this service. He said, I am the same God that saved you, that rescued you when you was lost in your sin, when you were caught up in your own stuff, when everything was about you. I am still the one that saved you then, and I sustain you now. It wasn't by your goodness then. It's not by your goodness now. It's my hand. I believe the Lord is going to bring His Word to pass. Come on, y'all. All of His Word. All of His Word. Jesus said, heaven and earth is going to pass away, but my words will by no means ever pass away. So guess what? Heaven and earth, everything's going to pass away. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, but His Word's still going to remain. So what should we be fighting with? 
the only thing that's unshakable. The only thing that's immovable. The only thing that can't be destroyed. It can be mocked, but it's still going to come to pass. God's Word describes making it into heaven as a narrow gate. Hmm. But in America, especially in the American church, they've tried to make the gate very wide. Where everyone's going to make it in. But here's what the Word says about it. Put it on the screen. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very what? And the road is what? And only a few ever find it. But he doesn't stop there. Go to that next scripture. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? And he replied, work hard to enter the narrow door to God's kingdom. For many will try to enter, but will fail. When the master of the house has locked the door, it will be too late. You will stand outside knocking and pleading, Lord, open the door for us. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, but we ate and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. And he will reply, I tell you, I don't know you or where you come from. Get away from me, all you who do evil. Y'all, you say, Pastor Lane, this is, this is serious. Yes, it's serious because it's the Word of God which will not pass away. So we can't say, but, but Pastor Lane, that was then, now it's different. No, it isn't. God's Word never changes. These words will come to pass. The reason is simple. It is a spiritual gate. You can no more get your physical body through that spiritual gate than you can fight a spiritual battle in the natural. So I want you all to grab this. Follow me, Jordan. There's the gate to heaven. There's the gate to heaven right there. There it is. Say, Pastor Lane, no, it, it's got to be bigger than that. I, I, could, I, I can't even get the tip of my finger in there. I... I how can that be? I can't get through that gap. You can't physically, but you can spiritually. But here's the reality. you got to leave your flesh behind. You can't go through a spiritual door in natural means. You cannot go through a spiritual door through natural means. You can't win a war in the heavenlies through natural means. It's by the Spirit. It's by the Spirit. God is Spirit. We have to learn to live in the Spirit. We have to love in the Spirit. Pray with the Spirit. War in the Spirit. We have to leave our flesh behind in order to win the war. You know why that's uncomfortable to hear? Because our flesh is going, hey, wait a minute. But when we do, we begin to see what's on the other side of the door in the Spirit. Come on, y'all. And we begin to receive the Word that God is speaking in the Spirit. Come on, y'all. Not in the natural, oh, I'm going to find me a Scripture that can justify whatever I need. And then try to manipulate. That's flesh. But when the Spirit speaks, our flesh bows. Come on, somebody. We begin to receive the Word that He's speaking to us because it's feeding our spirit, not our flesh. I need to make a statement. The bigger people are in their own eyes, the bigger they are in their flesh, the harder it is to get through that narrow opening. 
Because no flesh will inherit the kingdom of God. None. None. Even the scripture says when the rapture, talking about the rapture, that we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Come on, y'all. You know why? Because our natural body can't handle heaven. It's spirit. Somebody say spirit. Spirit. With this being said, I want to address how we are to war in the spirit this morning. I want you to know that God is going to equip somebody today. Now, y'all weren't here Wednesday night, and and I wouldn't plan on adding this in, but I have to. There are five women mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew. And I might not remember all the names off the top of my head, but you're going to get the point. One of those was Rahab, the prostitute. In the genealogy of Jesus. And for those of you who weren't here, I was amazed to see because I never saw it before. Come on, y'all. The Lord's still speaking today. <laughs> Y'all remember when Ruth come out, she was a Moabite. Well, she's actually named in there too. She's one of those five women. And so she came from an ancestral relationship. Come on, Lot's daughter got him drunk, got pregnant, and had a child named Moab, and she was a Moabite, so she was from the descendant of an ancestral relationship. But Boaz married her anyway. And that seemed, man, he, he re- really went out there to marry this young lady. And, and, but when you know who his mama is, it ain't that big of a deal. Because his mama was Rahab the prostitute. Allow that to sink in. So that's two of the women mentioned. But it was also Tamar. Come on, y'all remember Judah's son died and, and he thought he was sleeping with a concubine. It actually was his daughter-in-law. And you say, but wait a minute, she was named in there? Yeah, and then other, another woman and then to Mary, the mother of Jesus, who they thought had slept around. So there was five women named in the, in the genealogy of Jesus. All of them had a questionable background. But there was one thing they had. They believed God so much that they acted on their faith. And God said, that's what I want in the DNA of my son. So I want to ask you, even if you've made mistakes, can you believe God enough to act on your faith anyway? Because that's really what he's looking for. So here it is. Now that I got that out the way, I think that covers just about everybody in the room. Anybody in here never made a mistake? Raise your hand so we can worship you. That includes everybody in the room. But now that you understand that, how many of y'all want to know how to use the sword? That's the title of the message today. We're in Genesis chapter 18, verse 16. If you got it, say got it. Y'all know the scripture, but y'all thinking we're going in a different direction than what God has for us to go. Then the men got up from the meal and looked out towards Sodom. As they left, Abram, Abraham went with them to send them on their way. Should I hide my plan from Abraham, the Lord asked. For Abraham will certainly become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. I have singled him out so that he will direct his sons and their families to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. Then I will do for Abraham all that I have promised. Verse 20. So the Lord told Abraham, I have heard a great outcry from Sodom and Gomorrah because their sin is so flagrant. I'm going down to see if their actions are as wicked as I have heard. If not, I want to know. The other men turned and headed towards Sodom, but the Lord remained with Abraham. Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away both the righteous and the wicked? Suppose you find 50 righteous people living there in the city. Will you still sweep it away and not spare it for their sakes? Surely you would not do such a thing, destroying the righteous along with the wicked. Why, you would be treating the righteous and the wicked exactly the same. Surely you wouldn't do that. Should not the judge of all the earth do what is right? And the Lord replied, If I find 50 righteous people in Sodom, I will spare the city for their sake. Then Abraham spoke again, since I have begun, let me speak further to my Lord. Even though I am but dust and ashes, suppose there are only 45 righteous rather than 50. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? 
And the Lord said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 righteous people there. Then Abraham pressed his request further. Suppose there are only 40. And the Lord replied, I will not destroy it for the sake of the 40. Please don't be angry, my Lord, Abraham pleaded. Let me speak. Suppose only 30 righteous people are found. And the Lord replied, I will not destroy it if I find 30. Then Abraham said, since I have dared to speak to the Lord, let me continue. Suppose there are only 20. And the Lord replied, then I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. Finally, Abraham said, Lord, please don't be angry with me if I speak one more time. Suppose only 10 are found there. And the Lord replied, then I will not destroy it for the sake of the 10. When the Lord had finished his conversation with Abraham, he went on his way and Abraham returned to his tent. Father, I thank you for your anointing. Lord God, that's not going to be on the word, but that is already here now. In Jesus name I pray. And everyone said, Amen. I want to talk about intercession this morning. You see, we all know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and its destruction, and we focus so much on the destruction and the reason for it that we miss that there's a major thing going on, and I believe God is equipping the body of Christ for this day. Not just this era of time, but this day. Literally this day. Abraham is interceding for his nephew Lot, even though he never mentions him by name. How's, inter, how's Abraham interceding for Lot? By appealing to God's righteousness. Concerning the plans that he had for destruction, he started to appeal. I want to reread it, put that scripture back on the screen. Surely you wouldn't do such a thing, destroying the righteous along with the wicked. Why, you would be treating the righteous and the wicked exactly the same. Surely you wouldn't do that. Should not the judge of all the earth do what is right? He never mentions Lot by name. Without mentioning him, he's appealing to God to defend his own great name. I believe that people in the body of Christ are praying for people by name because they're caught up in the name. They're not petitioning God. To uphold his own righteousness. Because if he upholds his own righteousness, it might not be the way we want. So we pray according to what we want instead of according to what he wants. Mm, I figured it would be quiet. He did not say this. He didn't pray this average American Christian prayer. Lord, you know that if Lot was killed in all of this, it would really hurt my feelings, and I don't know if I could even trust you anymore. See, that's the American church way of praying. We call that intercession. Y'all remember we're in the middle of a fast, right? That's just how most people pray for those that they love without realizing that they're making themselves the object of the prayer. God, do this because my feelings hang in the balance. Not your righteousness. What I feel, what I want, make me comfortable, God. That's not how to intercede, saints. If Abraham is the father of our faith, then he is the father of a lot of things that we ought to be looking at. Abraham's laying out a foundation of what it takes to intercede on behalf of someone Make it about God. This isn't a trick, y'all. This isn't manipulation. It's the Spirit. Come on, y'all. Flesh is on one side of the door saying, but this is what I see, and so this is how I have to pray. And, and we don't understand that the Spirit sees through the crack in the door, and it sees how God wants us to pray. And our flesh doesn't want to receive what the Spirit is saying because they're contrary to one another. But it's spiritual. It's spiritual. And we see it all through Scripture. Here's another place. When Abigail came to David before he was king, he was coming down there to kill her wicked husband. Come on, he was wicked. And she, how does she appeal to him? Please do not do this because it's going to be a mark 
against your name when you become king. And David said, you are a wise person. She didn't say, please spare my husband because he's rich and I don't want to lose my riches and I don't want to lose my comfort zone. That's an American prayer. She appealed to the one who had the power to change things according to their own righteousness. She said, David, protect your name. You might be thinking, what's wrong with asking God to spare someone by name? That's like trying to stick your, thing, your fingerprint, fingertip in that crack. Why can't God just open the door a little wider? Why can't, why can't I do it my way? It, I know God says it, but I don't understand. Why is he making it so difficult? This word is being streamed online, and I pray people are listening. Because the days are coming where your biggest detriment will be your flesh. And you have to see in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit and war in the Spirit and love in the Spirit to win in this day. That wide open door has never been that wide open. It's trying to find a way to justify fleshly desires and what we want instead of seeking to fight in the Spirit. There isn't anything wrong with asking God to heal someone by name. Can I hear an amen? Amen. But if that's all we know, because it's learned behavior, then it's become religious at best and absolutely powerful, lack of power at worst. Not powerful, lack of power. You're so past lane. How can it be lack of power? Because we are focused totally on a person and ourselves and how it makes us and those around us feel, and we took God completely out of the equation. Not, Father, you be magnified. But, Lord, just think if you touch them, then then these people could come in. And really, I could feel so much better. Is that why people ask the Lord to add to the church? Because they feel better when it's fuller? Or are we actually asking God, Father, be magnified. Rescue people because it lifts up your name. Before the, are, are we grabbing this? He is the king, y'all. He's the glorious one. He gets all the glory. All the glory. When we pray and it comes to pass, we don't get credit for that. That's his work. Okay, we ain't got there yet, but at least I got your attention. <clears throat> Watch this. Put the next scripture up. Abraham got up early that morning and hurried out to the place. This is in Genesis chapter 19 where he had stood in the Lord's presence. He looked out across the plain towards Sodom and Gomorrah and watched as columns of smoke rose from the cities like smoke from a furnace. Next part. But God had listened to Abraham's request and kept Lot safe, removing him from the disaster that engulfed the cities of the plain. Abraham never asked God, To protect Lot. Come on, y'all. He appealed to God's righteousness. And that is what protected. Are we grabbing something today? There's a level of intercession that is effective in the spiritual realm. And we think, well, i got to say it this way and i got to do it this way. And it's not that. That's flesh. Come on, y'all. That's religious. Do I have to use this scripture? Oh, here. Let's email everybody this prayer and tell them that if you pray this prayer, God's going to add money to your bank account. We've all seen and deleted those. Except some folks have prayed those. And actually looked at their account to see if it grew. Are we still in here today? Because our flesh longs to be the object. And God longs for the whole object of our prayer to be by the Spirit. Abraham had a close enough relationship with the Lord to make it about him and his reputation. He knew that when God would see this, he would protect them. But if I didn't say their name right, Or if I didn't quote the scripture right, is there anybody in here 
We literally have become so fleshly minded that we put the culmination of the power of God moving on our ability to say it just right. That's all flesh. That's all flesh. Abraham knew. He didn't have to mention him by name. He knew. But there's something else that needs to be addressed right here. And here it is. The righteous will not be caught up in the destruction of the wicked. Come on, y'all. That's a promise for somebody. Will there be difficult times? Absolutely. Look at what life. He was, he was torn up about the wickedness that was all around him. But he was living in a city that was wicked. There's going to be def- difficult times coming, saints. But that destruction didn't hurt Lot. Now, they wanted to hurt him. Come on, the people of the city wanted to hurt him. They wanted to kill him. And, and they would have, but the angels were there. Come on, y'all. Pulled him in and protected him. But when the angels was pulling him out of the city, they said, hurry to this little city because we can't bring any destruction on these cities until you are safe. Come on, y'all. There's going to be wickedness going on in the earth. And it's coming. Fa- in fact, it's not coming like a long slope. It's, it's, it's here. It's already here. It's here and abounding everywhere. I put out a thing the other day on Facebook just to see. Jesus Christ is King of all kings. Lord of all lords. And no man will get to heaven unless they be born again. And if you want to give your heart to Christ, you need to. And at the end of that, I wrote, I'm just trying to wake up the woke crowd. See, if they try. Do y'all really want to start fighting this already? Because it's coming close. I've watched where CNN's already calling Mark Rubio, who is not the pillar of the Christian faith, Bible boy. Said it in a negative connotation because they're trying to put down the Bible. It's already here. I believe the church is going to go through some difficult times, but I believe that the Lord is going to keep us from the destruction that's coming. God's going to take His church out. Come on, y'all. He's going to take His church out. But until that day comes, we need to learn how to war in the Spirit. Won't you turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. If you've been saved for any length of time, your Bible's probably going to fall open to that. Because it's the armor of God. Ephesians 6 and 10. While you turn on, get a sip of water. Verse 10. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. But against evil rulers and authorities in the unseen world. They're on the other side of the door. Against mighty powers in this dark world. And against evil spirits in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor. That's a spiritual thing. So you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take what? The sword of the Spirit, which is what? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. I want to talk about the sword of the Spirit. I never want to seem like I'm trying to put one of God's pieces of armor above the others. But I need to talk about the sword of the Spirit. And here's why. All of the armor of God is for your protection. 
all of it. It's for your protection. It's for defense from the kingdom's attack. Except the sword of the Spirit. It is literally made for offense. Oh my goodness. We're, of en- we're enough of a sports community to realize that you can't only play defense and win. At some point, you got to play offense. And when you dig down into the original, you get into the hermeneutics of this passage, the Scripture says, so that we can stand. And having done all else, to stand. But you know what? That real that word stand is withstand. So we can withstand. You know what that word is? Offense. And having done all else, play defense. But we are called to be offensive. Not just defensive. Yes, the whole armor of God is there for our defense. Except the Word of God led by the Spirit of God. It's for offense. It's for taking ground. It's for taking our marriage. It's for taking our families. It's for taking our health. It's for offense. It's offense. I want you to hear this. It's called the sword of the Spirit. Okay, maybe y'all didn't grab that. The sword that the Holy Spirit uses is the Word of God. It's not some imagine, it's not emotion, it's not anything fleshly at all. It's the Word of God. The very sword in the Spirit's hand that's sharper than any two-edged sword, that no weapon formed against it shall prosper, the sword that's in the Spirit's hand that the enemy cannot defeat is the Word of God. It's not our emotions. It's not our weeping over our loved ones. It's it's the Word of God. That's the sword that the Spirit wields. The kingdom of darkness has nothing against it. I said nothing against it. The sword that is so mighty that it is the weapon God gives us to intercede with. Is the word. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by the devil himself, what did he do? It is written. All three temptations, it is written. And when the devil tried to manipulate him with the word, says, Yes, it is written, Jesus said, But it is also written. So the enemy will try to manipulate the Word. But you know what? A manipulation of the Word only happens on this side of the door. Come on, y'all. It doesn't happen on the other side where the Spirit leads because He's the maker of the Word. He's the revealer of the Word. And when we grab the Word in Spirit, we begin, watch this, not to fight, to win. We have an undefeated champion. Undefeated. He said, with Jesus down on the cross, he said, nobody takes my life from me. I have the power to lay it down and pick it back up again. Ain't nobody took that from me. When he was led by the, by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted, the Spirit only led him there because he knew he was equipping him with the Word. Come on, y'all. It doesn't matter what you face. You only feel like you lose when you fight in the flesh. Because when you war with the sword of the Spirit, you cannot lose. You say, Pastor Lane, I don't believe that. As your faith is, so be it unto you. Come on, that's still that's sitting on this side trying to get your finger through the door. You know, that, that door is really it's so narrow. It's so narrow that you really can't even get the tip of your finger through it. You know what you can get through it, though? The tip of the sword of the Spirit. The devil has no weapon formed against this that will prosper. None, none, none. When Jesus was tempted, he had the word. Come on, he gives us the word. The word is the sword. If we want to win the battles that are before us, we have to fight with the word of God. It is the sword of the Spirit. You might feel like trying to get through God's narrow gate is so hard that you you, you can't. It's just too narrow. Is anybody listening today? 
with the Spirit of God, you can do all things. All things. How about that lost loved one that seems to be so rebellious? Come on, so rebellious. Well, Pastor Lane, I've looked up some Scriptures and I've been standing on them, but I'm not seeing anything. You just explained that you didn't even believe those Scriptures. Rahab didn't go, I don't know, what are they going to think about me if I let them over the side of the wall and tell them they went this way when they went, I, I, what's the government official going to think of me? If somebody finds out, what? no, you know what she said? She said, your God is God. He dried up the river. He killed the Egyptians. I'm letting y'all down this wall. Just remember me because I'm acting on what I know on the inside. He's real. If we don't grab that on the inside, then we don't war in the spirit. We war in the flesh under a spiritual context. That's the Holy Ghost. We cannot war in the flesh, regardless of how emotional it is and when. God's love for us is not based on how emotional things get. It's based on His Word. His Word. I said His Word. So watch how this changes everything. Revelation from the Word of God is given by the Holy Spirit. Can we agree? It's not an intellectual thing. It's not a, I'm going to get it kind of thing. It's given by the Holy Spirit or you're not going to get it. So the Holy Spirit's revealing revelation the Word of God so that that Word He's revealing can be used as a sword in your hand. Amen. Not to put on a shelf and say, oh, I remember when the Lord spoke this to me and hallelujah, praise the Lord. Hallelujah, praise the Lord doesn't set people free from demonic activity. You know what it does? The sword of the Spirit. I believe somebody's grabbing something today. And I believe you're going to get it before you get out of here. He gives us revelation in the Word to wield and spiritual warfare. I want to say that again. The only reason for the Lord to give you revelation in the Word, which is the sword of the Spirit, is to use the sword of the Spirit. Not to fight against people because that's not it. It's to fight for them. And I believe there's a whole massive group of people in, in what's called the body of Christ who's searching the Word so they can get the sword of the Spirit to fight for themselves. What they're going through, their feelings, their emotion, what they want, instead of warring for someone else. He only gives revelation for warfare. The greater the revelation, the greater the ability to fight for people. Turn to somebody and say, for you. You see, you're not fighting for yourself in that moment. You know why? Because you know who you are. Come on, you, you've left yourself behind and chased after the Spirit to see what God has for you. So you're not fighting for yourself. You're already a victorious champion. He's putting a sword in your hand that's too big for your flesh to carry. Only your spirit in faith can carry that sword. This is not just to intercede for people in our prayer life. It goes much farther than that. I want to talk about evangelism. See, there's a lot of folks in the body of Christ who are afraid to evangelize. You know why? Because they got their tip of their finger in the crack of the door and they say, I can't do that. They don't realize that revelation in the Word of God is a sword that cuts the kingdom of darkness's lies and foundational untruths and bondage off of people. I believe that in these days, God is going to start bringing people into the house of God because he's going to start tearing down every altar of Baal and Ashtoreth, every false god there is. He's going to bring destruction on them just like he did the children of Israel. And the scripture says in those days, 10 Gentiles will cling to one Jew and say, lead us to your God. I believe we're going to see that. But we need to be equipped for that day because they don't need another religion. That had no power to save them to start with. 
And they're going to come with their questions and their fears and their doubts and their messed up religious ideas. And in that moment, they need the power of the Word of God. I think we're moving into gear. Now I pray somebody starts grabbing something. When the Holy Spirit gives revelation in His Word, He is strengthening the sword of the Spirit in our hands to war against the kingdom of darkness that's holding people captive. Or in bondage. Someone, someone says, but what about this? And what about that? In that moment, the Holy Spirit is going to reach in and grab some of that Word. Come on, that revelation that He gave you 10 years ago that's been sitting there dormant. Come on, y'all. But we say, Holy Ghost, if you bring somebody across my path and they've got questions, you've got answers. Here I am. And he reaches in and grabs that word and says, but the word says. Watch how powerful this is. It rescues individuals from the lives of darkness. It isn't that you're smarter than others. That's the flesh. It's just that you know the power that set you free. And the sword of the Spirit is revelation in God's Word that it takes the door that seems to be shut in somebody else's eyes and puts a crack in it and they can see light. And they go, oh, yeah, but I still can't get there. That's okay. We're going to get you there. So when someone is under a heavy weight of despair and the Word rises up in you to speak and you speak that Word, watch this, when you speak that Word of the Spirit to that person, you're not speaking it to the person. You're thrusting the spear into despair. Oh, come on, somebody. You're thrusting it in. When someone is fearful that their children may not make it into heaven, and that word rises up in you, if I save you, I'll save your whole household. You're taking that spear and thrusting it into their fear. When someone doesn't believe that God can love them or that a loving God can even exist, the word of God rises up in you, and you take that word and speak it. It's the sword of the Spirit thrusting into their unbelief. Are y'all grabbing this? When someone doesn't believe that God can heal them, you speaking the revelation of the Word of God is thrusting that sword of the Spirit into that sickness. And that sickness has no weapon formed against it that can prosper. Say, but Pastor Lane, didn't someone in the Word say, Lord, heal me if you are willing? The Lord said, oh, I'm willing. Boom. You say, but Pastor Lane, I, I, I'm not there yet. That's because we're caught up on this side of the door. Come on, somebody. It's, it's that we don't have enough faith or we believe, oh, I got enough faith to do that. No, it ain't about either one of those. That's the, it's about the Spirit, Lord. It's not me. It's you. Your greatest tool in helping others, interceding for others, winning the lost to Jesus is to chase after the Word of God. Believing that the Holy Spirit is big enough to give you what you need for who He wants to bring across your path. Watch this. In that moment, you're no longer fighting in the flesh. When He gives you revelation in the Word, you go, Oh God, thank you. Who is this for? Who is this for? And I've done too much wrong for God to love me. He's not mad at you. Is that what you're thinking? The Word says that He loved you so much He sent His Son to die for you. And you're taking the sword of the Spirit and thrusting it into that lie. Are, are y'all grabbing this? So we learn the Word of God so that we could take the sword of the Spirit and begin to win in the heavenly. We're winning in the Spirit. That's where the battle is won. In that moment, you begin to totally put all of your trust in the leading of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that the bottom line? He longs for you to have His sword in your hand. I, I don't know if y'all grabbing that. The Spirit of God longs for you to have His sword in your hand. The Holy Spirit has never lost. Never never 
Oh, but Pastor Lane had some things that happened. Whatever you, you fixing to say for your reason to doubt him is the flesh. Come on, y'all. He has never lost a battle. And the only weapon he has is this sword. And he's offering it to us. You know what that means? When you grab it, you cannot lose. I said, when you grab it, you cannot lose. The only way for you to lose is to put the sword down and start living by the tip of your finger again. Some people have wooden swords. Y'all, y'all want, can I give y'all a description of a wooden sword? The itinerant Jews. I bind you by the Jesus Paul preaches. And the demon says, Jesus, I know. Paul, I, but who are you? I can tell that you don't even believe that. And the demons jumped on him, beat him, and he left bleeding and naked. I believe that there's a bunch of believers in the body of Christ in this day that's scared they're going to have to run bleeding and naked. But you know what? I ain't running because God's given me a sword for this day and this hour. He saved me and he saved you for such a time as this. Are you going to put the sword in your hand or are you going to hide it in your church? Setting our hearts on the leading of the Holy Spirit. And everything is so much more important than we could have ever fathomed. Whether we're praying for loved ones or asking Him to teach us how to pray. The Holy Spirit. Y'all realize when you say, Lord, teach me how to pray. Guess what He does? When you go, man, I asked the Holy Spirit to show me. Guess what He showed me? It's going to be in the Word. Every time. Every time. Every time. When you're afraid, God, I don't know what we're going to do. I don't have enough resources, and, and I just don't know what I'm going to do with my finances. He leads you. The Holy Ghost says, I know how to provide for my own. I own the cows, and, cows on a thousand hills. He leads you to the Word. I've been young, and now I'm old, and I've never seen the righteous forsaken of the seed begging bread. The Holy Spirit, whenever we cry out to Him, He always reveals the answer in the Word. So, saints, while the rest of the nation is trying to silence the Word, God is bringing all of our focus back on it again. Because it is the weapon of choice. In the hands of the living God. Come on, y'all. In the hands of the living God. When we set our hearts on this, everything changes. When we intercede for our nation, He'll give us A word from heaven. Come on, y'all. Not emotion. Not a person. His glory. Come on, y'all. Do y'all realize that the glory of heaven is going to be better than the glory of America? If we're trying to help someone grow in the Lord, the Holy Ghost will give us a word. Come on, somebody. And when we stand on that and we share that word, the sword of the Spirit is cutting all the lies of darkness off of them to set them free. We're trying to reach the lost. The power to accomplish God's will is all grounded in the Word. It's the Holy Spirit who reveals. Do you trust Him? I'm going to say it again. Do you, we say, but Pastor Lane, how can I trust somebody that I don't really know that well? Then there's your answer. Get to know Him. Jesus said, I'm not leaving your orphans. I'm sending another, and he's just like me. Except the difference is he has the power to reveal. Do you all realize that Jesus is not the revelator? Somebody said, wait, 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 what? Well, he's not the father. He's the son. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the firstborn of many brethren. But he is not the revelator. There's proof. Because Peter done backslid and he said, listen to me, Peter. You're going to feed my sheep, but you need to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. And when he comes, he's going to reveal. Because he's the revelator. This is how we accomplish the impossible. This is how we go beyond fretting over our fingertip in a crack and knowing that our name's on the other side. It's by faith in this. Listen, do you realize that you don't even call Jesus your Savior on your own? Put that scripture on the screen. 
So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. You can't even get born again except by the Holy Spirit. If that's the power of God to set you free, then it's the power of God to work salvation through you into somebody else's life. Even our salvation is because of the Holy Spirit. He reveals. Saints, this is the sword of the Spirit. And it's what is going to be needed to wage war in these last days. Can't be for our purpose. It's got to be for the king's purpose. Come on, y'all. That he's glorified. You say, well, Pastor Lane, what if the nation ends up getting destroyed and and all the Christian values has been standing on the throne to the side? Will we be walking in faith when Jesus comes again? Because I can tell you this, reading throughout the New Testament, there wasn't any of those nations godly nations. In fact, they opposed the gospel with everything they had, and the champions of faith were standing there anyway. This is our lot. This is our day. Today was not designed for Daniel, for Peter, for Paul. It was designed for us, children of the Most High God, redeemed out from under heavy garbage, to stand in His Spirit today. 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 It's my prayer that something has happened in somebody's heart today. You realize that thinking in the natural and fighting in the natural will bear no fruit. It will not win. But chasing after God's word with the leading of the Holy Spirit will equip you to not only fight, but to win. Win. Win every battle. I can't help but finish in with this one thing. I pray that while this is going on the internet, the guy that got saved this night would see this and call us up. It was the first time I'd ever did witnessing two question tests at the state fair. And many of y'all have heard this story before, but I'm going to say it again because it fits. And there was two guys and they were harassed me. It was cold like today. And they were trying to run the people off and get them to not come up in there. Get away from them religious nuts. And that, Now, it's cold like today, and they had cut-off shirts. All muscled up, multicolored mohawk, about halfway down the back, feathered earrings, talking like they from Southern California. And I said, hey, guys, come on. Y'all have been around this thing all night long. Why don't you come in and take the test? And the guy walks up, and he goes, okay, dude, we're going to take your stupid test, bruh. And they sat down, and I started going through the two-question tests with them, and, and one of them is just mocking everything. The other dude said, man, just shut up and let the dude talk. And we're going all the way to the end. When it got to the end, I said, Holy Ghost, give me what they need. You know. And he did. And I spoke exactly what he gave me. I looked at them and said, let me ask you something. What are you going to do if you walk, went nuts and walked up into Mickey D's and sprayed that place down with an Uzi? How could you ever repay those parents for the loss of their kids? No, we can't, dude. I said, what are they going to do with you? Man, they're going to put me in the chair. I said, that's right. They're going to put you in the chair. And I sat down, and I said, and they're going to strap your leg, and they're going to put that leather across your chest and strap your arms down. And just before they put that leather boot over your face to keep your eyes from blowing out when the voltage hits, you look up, and there's all the parents of the kids that you killed watching your execution. And the executioner says, okay, I'm ready. And he goes to throw the switch, and someone says, wait. Walks over there, and undoes the straps. Says, get up. Sits down in the chair and says, he can go free. I'll pay for what he did. He said, are you telling me that that's what Jesus did on the cross? I said, yes, sir, and he did it for you. Both of those men gave their heart to Christ right there. So don't tell me that the Holy Ghost doesn't know how to reach into somebody's heart if you believe. It's the power of the Spirit. In the natural, there was nothing to grab. There was nothing else to say. But in the Spirit, He knew how to get up in there and yank that heart out from under the devil's hand. Saints, we're going to have to walk by the Spirit of God with the sword of the Spirit in these last days in order to win. I'm just going to finish with this. There ain't no election going to change this. No matter who's holding what office in the natural, it doesn't change the power 
of God's Word. So either we're going to live this way, fight this way, worship this way, win this way, or we're going to stand there with our finger in the tip of the door going, I don't know why you just won't make it wider. I didn't get a good amen right there. But there should have been the best amen of all. I know that God is dealing with our carnality right now, our flesh. And you feel like that's a cut. I know it's our human nature. Come on, y'all. But isn't that what we're supposed to leave behind so we could get to what the Spirit has? That's what His whole Word is about. I want everyone to bow your heads right now. Saints, you have just heard a Spirit-led message. And I know that it's spoken to your heart. And where do these things stand with you? Where are you at right now? with the Lord because everything you heard today can only lead you to a place of accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior you just heard me say live in the message everyone bow your head so I'm speaking to you right now have you ever given your heart to the Lord Jesus and and maybe you had at some point but you walked away but right now the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart And you want to give your life to Christ or you want to come back to him. If either one of those fits you, I want to lead you in a simple prayer. But I'm going to tell you, it's going to take being real with God in your heart. It's going to take you being wide open to him and truthful and honest with him. And if you are, the Lord's fixing to do something in your life. If that's you and you really mean it, I want you to repeat after me. Lord Jesus... I realize that I'm a sinner. And I cannot pay for my sin. But you love me so much that you sent your son Jesus and he took my punishment. He paid the price for my sin. I repent of my sin, Lord. Forgive it. Cover it with the blood of Jesus. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And from this day forward, Jesus is Lord of my life. Amen. I want to tell you something. Did you mean that with all of your heart? Because if you did, God just covered all of your sin with the precious blood of his son. Do you know what that means? That means that God can no longer see you at your worst. He only sees your life at his son's best. That means you are welcome to come into the presence of the Lord. You don't have to be ashamed because it's paid for. What kind of awesome God is this? And the devil's been trying to convince you that God is mad at you. And the whole time the truth is, is God is madly in love with you. I want to rejoice with you, saints. Here's what you need to do. This isn't the end. It's only the beginning. You need to find a church that teaches the word of God and truth. And you need to get plugged in. You say, well, pastor, what about coronavirus? Let the spirit of the Lord lead you and you follow him. The devil's been leading people to destruction for centuries. Now it's time for the spirit of God to lead you. Get plugged in. Learn more about the Word. Search God's Word, asking God's Spirit to reveal that Word. But do not stop here. It's just the beginning. Amen? God bless you and looking forward to seeing you one day, even if it's in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Thanks for listening today. We pray that this message spoke to you and that you're standing on the promises of God, that he is for you and not against you. He will never leave you or forsake you in Jesus name. Join us right here next week for another inspiring message.